the travelogue is going to Turkey. Turkey. It's a place that's held my fascination for years, and so I was quite happy to fly halfway around the world to arrive at the former capital, Istanbul. The city straddles two continents, Europe and Asia, and its erstwhile name of Constantinople conjures up images of romance and epic battles. Today, Istanbul's skyline is a glorious confusion of old and new. This huge metropolis with its 13 million strong population is the start of our exciting adventure in Turkey. You see that? Welcome to Asia. I've taken five steps and now I'm in Europe. This is the only place in the entire world where you can do that. But it was also the place that was the start and end of the Silk Road. And it's home to legends like Choi, King Midas and Alexander the Great. This is a country that's so beautiful, it'll make you laugh and it'll make you cry. Welcome to Turkey. Now, Turkey's history is mind-boggling in its complexity. So my suggestion, begin your journey in the old part of Istanbul. You can walk there or catch a tram. Day number one, and uh, we're in the Sultan Ahmet area, which is the old part of town, and probably the most visited because we've got the Top Kapı Palace, the Hagia Sophia, and the Blue Mosque over there. So three birds with one stone. Istanbul is inevitably associated with the pleasure-loving sultans of the Ottoman Empire. You get a sense of their opulent lifestyle as soon as you enter through the imperial gate. The palace was built in the 15th century by Mehmet the Conqueror after he captured Constantinople. He conceived it as a series of four lavishly decorated courtyards. The first courtyard was open to all but the second was strictly for business. Here, the Sultan held audiences with his subjects and performed his ceremonial duties. Actual meetings of state took place instead in the Imperial Council Chamber. If the Sultan had time, he'd attend the meetings, but later Sultans cleverly installed a grill above the room, behind which they could eavesdrop. Although, most of the time, they were actually in the harem, frolicking with beautiful ladies. Completely understandable. You'll also notice the chimney line palace kitchens. These could accommodate up to 1,000 staff. Talk about excess. Apparently, this sword um, may or may not have belonged to the founder of the Ottoman Empire, but I, I like to think that it, uh, it did belong to him. But it's a pretty impressive broadsword. I can't quite imagine how he could have carried it into battle, but still, this is uh, very appropriate for the founder of the Ottoman Empire. The treasury houses many jewel-encrusted items gifted to the sultans, including an 86-carat diamond. No, ladies, it's not for sale. The two courts we saw outside was uh, pretty much public domain, but once we pass this point, the public world separates from the private world. And here, here is the private world of the Sultan, where whatever happens here, stays here. The palace was a maze of secrets. Only the Sultan's family and his most important servants could enter the third court. It was home to the harem, to the imperial family, and of course, the Sultan's many concubines. The fourth court was reserved solely for the Sultan. It was his back garden and a place for him to get away from the pressures of controlling such a vast empire. This is it the innermost court of the Top Kappa Palace, the private playground and uh, retreat of the Sultan and his family. But man, this is such an incredible view. You've got a massive panoramic view of his entire empire, Europe on this side, and across the Bosphorus, the mighty continent of Asia.
Just down the street from the top Kappa Palace is the granddaddy of Istanbul, the Hagia Sophia. Initially built as a basilica in the 4th century, it heralded a new beginning for the Byzantine Roman Empire. What you see today is a third version of the building. It later changed to a mosque and it's now become a museum. But wait till you see inside. Man, look at all of this. This is uh, pretty incredible, but I've not looked down since coming in. I'm not going to stop, but there's just so much. It's kind of all coming at you from every single different direction. It's kind of like looking at the Milky Way. On the wall above, we find something very interesting. There are four angels, but only one of them has a face. The Ottomans could not have icons in their mosque, so they simply plastered over the Christian mosaics. It was either that or scratched them out. Minarets and Quranic decorations were added, but the overall structure stayed the same. And just like Istanbul, peel off one layer of the Hagia Sophia and you'll discover a new face of history right underneath. I think that's probably the best example of how Hagia Sophia is built upon layers of itself because uh, if you look at the top, this golden bit is uh, from the Ottoman era but right underneath the bit that's cracked off is revealing paints from the original Byzantine Empire church built 1500 years ago. Very impressive stuff. Right, so the Hagia Sophia is over there. So it's the Top Kapi Palace. The uh, Sea of Marmara is back down that way. And I'm going to head over there, which is the Blue Mosque. The Blue Mosque is all about ambition. It was designed by a student of Mimar Sinan, the greatest architect of the Ottoman period, and built 400 years ago. Controversially, it had six minarets, the same number as the Kaaba in Mecca, the most sacred site in Islam. Whereas the Hagia Sophia stuns with its interior, the Blue Mosque wows with its exterior. To this day, the Blue Mosque is as much a world-renowned tourist site as it is a place of worship. I think this place is it's really quite different to the Hagia Sophia. I mean, when you go into the Hagia Sophia, you get this you get all of these designs that jump out at you and try to grab your attention. But when you come here, everything makes you focus your attention on yourself. And when you sit down, you feel like you're, you can really become calm and I guess it helps you to find inner peace. But why was it called the Blue Mosque? Well, it gets its name from the 20,000 ceramic tiles lining its walls. These were handcrafted and very expensive. Many of the colours you see today are as vibrant as they were 400 years ago.